forgot the microphone. Welcome to On the Chain. This is Jeff. We're going to have a uh, great evening uh, today. Let me uh, get up the keep file and we're going to figure out what we are going to talk about today. Ripple XRP. You know what? It's all about payments. That's it. All about payments. We got some interesting stuff, even some lawsuit updates. Which lawsuit you might ask? That is the SEC v Ripple lawsuit. And you say, why do we keep talking about that? Well, it keeps giving more updates. So we're going to get back into that. And guess what? What is up with Flair? That's what I want to know. What is going on with Flair? It has been so long, so many things happening. And where are we at this point with Flair? I don't know, but we're going to find out. We're going to talk about all those things in just a minute. You guys ready? Let's go. Welcome to On The Chain. Welcome to On The Chain. What is up, everybody? Give a quick shout out from where you are tuning in from. And that's about it. It'll be uh, great to see uh, what kind of commentary we have in today's chat. Where are we going to start? Where are we going to start? You know what? I think I'm going to start with uh, Baba because Baba Cugs comes through again uh, with an interesting video. Now, this is all about the solving of interoperability way back in 2016. Let me see. Let me see if we can pull this up. Let's see if we can go full screen. Let's see if we can get some volume on it. See if we can share the screen. But this is going to be an interesting uh, video. We've got a couple great videos to uh, dissect today. We're even going to talk about Link2. Uh, Link2 is up to something big because they just bought something not that long ago. And we're going to find out exactly what that is. So we've got Atlanta, Ontario. we got Michigan in the house. West Virginia, Texas, Kansas. Uh, what else we got? We got UK. So let's see who we can, how many uh, countries are we going to have in here before the end of the evening? So, all right, let's bring this up. Let us see what this is all about. Um, not sure who this is speaking. If you guys recognize him, don't know who it is, but let's see what he has to say anyways. In mobile money when we're using Venmo. See if you guys can hear it. Or something, which is a, a, a fancy. Uh, a He's talking about Venmo and, and Zelle. Let me know if you guys can hear that, if that was uh, too soft. If it's too soft, uh, we're going to have to move on. And then maybe we'll find a uh, another way of uploading that. It seemed really soft on my end. And I've got the... Uh, that's Corey. All right. So let's see here. We'll see if we can download that into a different... Uh, you guys can hear it? All right. So if you can hear it, then that's all good seemed really soft. Soft? That's what I thought. So, all right, let's go to our downloader. Now we'll try to download it. In the meantime, um, we also have some interesting uh, uh, conversation to have over, let's see, Twitter. Oh, I don't want the iPhone. There we go. All right, I think I've got the right one. There we go. Let's get rid of that. Let's grab it. Sometimes when you download it uh, through this, it actually enhances the audio, which is kind of crazy because you would expect the audio on Twitter would be decent. This might be just as light, though. Let me see. Maybe it's just recorded super soft. Let's see what we got for volume. I think it's exactly the same. Let me listen real quick. No, you know what? It's way too soft. So let's move on with life. It was an interesting video. Really interesting. VLC media player. I'm going to have to check that one out. I've, I've tried a couple different solutions, but sometimes you pull it through Twitter and it's just way too soft. So, all right, let's move on. That was, it was a good one. It's really talking about kind of interoperability. It was talking about uh, a lot of things that are transparent, transpiring right now within uh, crypto, which is really the direction we want to see everything moving in. But let's go into this. This was... Um, this was just uh, about a week ago. Um, this was on the PR Newswire. Linkdo completes acquisition of Trustline, uh, moving the company closer to an investment exchange built on blockchain. So Linkdo is a great source if you want to go and buy um, some of those pre-IPO shares. 
you can run over to link to i think you can still find ripple over on link to um, this is really interesting that they're buying the trust line so built on the xrp ledger trust line uses cutting edge tech to provide more efficient and cost effective financial services now think about what this acquisition means for you know this provider they're quickly moving into blockchain they're quickly moving into a solution that's using the xrp ledger so here's the ceo of of uh, link to we acquired trust line for its advanced blockchain tech and ip including two hundred thousand dollars worth of xrp grants issued from the xrpl grants program so that's massive uh to move into that acquisition to not have to necessarily sit and build it uh, this is really what we're seeing a lot of right now. We're going to see more and more of these companies that want to get into blockchain. They want to get into blockchain tech, but instead of uh, making it from the ground up, uh, it'll happen through acquisition. We see a lot of big companies that get into um, other product categories through acquisition. Uh, GE being one of the, the big ones that has gotten into lots of different industries through acquisition. Um, and now we're seeing this, uh, we're going to see a consolidation in the space as many of these companies start buying up, you know, other companies. So this is really big, though, because here you have, again, a solution that allows you to go pre IPO and buy shares. Uh, but now they're acquiring. So the trust line giving them and think about what this could potentially mean uh, if we're looking for the security, uh, the uh, if you want a tokenization of uh, securities. So here's link to exchange will be auditable, publicly transparent, 100 percent on blockchain, which is huge. This is kind of the the new world. Uh, the new financial technologies are moving rapidly in this direction. And we have another video that we'll watch uh, later on kind of referencing that exact thing and what's happening in the banking space. Um, so here we have Trustline thrilled to join the initiative. Groundbreaking work that LinkedIn is doing in making private investing simple for individual investors who have been shut out of traditional private equity asset classes. So this is this is massive. You know, this is bringing it to the people. Um, I, you still need to be an accredited investor uh, to buy. So that's what we have here. LinkedIn is a leader in liquidity in the private sector, providing accredited investors access to affordable investment opportunity in the world's top unicorns. So it's a big LinkedIn is a big deal for sure. Um, and now they are going to be using a platform built on the XRPL, even a bigger deal. So we're going to expect massive, massive things coming out of Link2. I'm excited about it. Excited to see, you know, the direction that, you know, that this entire industry is moving in. Look at that. I'm getting shimmery. <laughs> My shirt is shimmering. That's awesome. So uh, let's see. Oh, you guys are re responding to that's right that was uh corey johnson he used to be the chief marketing at ripple that's right that's who that was i knew i recognized him talk about link to mr b hasn't been in here for a minute you're right you know what we haven't seen mr b in a long time so mr b big in the xrp space we've seen him a lot in the community as you guys know um works over at link to so that's really cool <clears throat> so um all right let's uh hang on let me look let me look what this is nothing absolutely nothing all right anyhow so what is uh my opinion on the fed versus cbdc so that that's a good one let's uh let's post that question i'm going to star that question and we'll come to that in a little bit but i think that's that's really uh that's really relevant you know, I kind of like that. I like that uh, question. And we're going to dig into that because, you know, we have uh, an opinion on CBDCs, you know, central bank digital currencies underscore central. And then we can get a little bit more into that. So, all right, let's uh, let's drill down a little bit here. Let's go to um, this one. Oh, here we go. OK, so this one I thought also very interesting. Now, this was a um, big uh, shout out here. Inc. 500, 5,000, sorry, Inc. Inc. 5,000. What is this exactly? Congratulations to Garland House, uh, Joel Katz, Friedman, and the entire team at Ripple for being voted by Inc. as one of the fastest growing companies in the U.S. We're proud to have Ripple be part of the DPF's journey to, in advocating for new forms of digital money in the U.K., Inc. 5,000. Big deal. I mean, it really is. We're starting to see a fast track again. 
think about the direction that these companies are moving in. Then you have on the other side of it, you have the SEC, you have Gary, right? You got, you know, good old Gary. Uh, so if you're saying probably still won't be smart enough for Gary, but you know, you've got, you know, it's amazing that we're seeing this direction, you know, ripple amongst other companies in the space that are, that are, have already identified, they've already recognized, uh, the crypto they've rep recognized this new financial, uh, technology, this new financial asset class and the powers that be, uh, let's, you know, the, the old way of doing thing, the brick and mortars are still trying to hold on to their, uh, their lineage, you know, their, their pedigree. They, they don't want to release it. You know, they believe that they're entitled to something, uh, that is actually beginning to move uh, past them. However, that's the struggle that we're seeing. So instead of embracing this new direction, they're still holding on to the old. Now, sometimes moving into something like, and that's where El Jefe is talking about uh, the CBDCs. Now, we move in the direction of a CBDC, and that's not necessarily positive, right? Because that's, you know, underscore uh, central, the central bank digital currency. Now, you know, uh, pair that with government control, and you have a lot of issues. You're lacking privacy. Then on the other side of it, you have these private companies that are building in the crypto space that are trying to decentralize access uh, to money, decentralize um, access to uh, the financial assets of the world, the banking infrastructures, uh, without having the old time brick and mortars that are dictating and dominating the space. So look at how the Fed is now influencing the ebb and flow uh, of of money just through uh, the lowering or the raising of interest rates. So now who is the Fed to dictate uh, the ebb and flow of interest rates? Uh, and so that that's a huge question to 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 really contemplate, you know, why is it that we have an unknown entity, meaning unknown, you know, who is behind it, that is allowed to move and regulate um, how our money uh, flow is. And this is, you know, problematic for many different levels. And so here we have, and, and seeing that you have a company like uh, Ripple that's recognized in the top, you know, Inc. 5000 is one of the fastest growing companies in the US. And at the same time, the SEC has filed a major lawsuit against this company. So they're trying to undermine the integrity of a company that's one of the fastest growing companies right now in the United States. And think about how many people it employs. Think about how much money it circulates. Uh, you know, so that so that's extremely you know can be extremely devastating. But yet they move on, right? So if Ripple as a company you know isn't uh, bowing down to the pressure of the SEC, then that's saying a lot of amazing things. So here we have right here um, from Brad Garlinghouse. Always nice to get a little third-party validation. Thank you, Ripplers. You are what makes Ripple one of the best. Now, what is this all about? So we just saw that they're one of the fastest growing co uh, companies, but check this out. This is from Ripple. This was August 8th. We're honored to be recognized by Fortune Magazine in the roundup of the best places to work coming in 34 in 100 best medium workplaces. So the top 100 that they picked and Ripple is ranked 34, which is a real, that's a big deal. We're continuing to grow our amazing team. Come and join us. If this is really their office, they got this beautiful kitchen. They got, you know, what looks to be, looks like they got some beers in there, you know, so you might uh, be drinking uh, uh, during office hours. I don't see a lot of water, but I see a lot of uh, soda. Maybe that's some coconut water over there. Got some yogurts if you want some yogurts. Then if you go top shelf, it looks like you can get some beer or something. But it's all good. But top places, top 34 uh, in the, you know, overall, uh, maybe that's in the in the U.S. I'm not sure. But really great stuff. You know, it's good to see these types of things and, you know, see that how it's recognized. Kombucha. <laughs> maybe that is kombucha. That was my second guess. I'll go to the beer first. Let's go beer and then and then maybe kombucha. <laughs> all right. So, so let's move on from there. You know, but. Anyhow, all right, let's go to, I want to go into reviewing uh, Flair, then we'll get back to El Jefe. We'll dig into that a little bit further as well and get some feedback from you guys uh, as we go. But this is, now I want to look at this one. So we've got, 
uh, Molly Elmore said, how will Flare Networks expand the uh, XRP ecosystem? Flare Networks is bringing smart contracts to the XRPL, which will open a world of DeFi opportunity. A threat on Flare Networks, why it's important for XRP. Now, there's a lot of reasons it's important to XRP, but Flare, there's a lot of reasons why it's actually needed uh, in the ecosystem as a whole. So there we go, McAllen18. I like that. <laughs> That's what that's what we should have up there. You know what? They should have a whole separate uh, section. Maybe that's not in the camera shot where they have the full stock bar. Got all top shelf scotch and whiskeys. That would be good. So, all right. So what, when we're looking at Flare Network, uh, again, you know, I think that this there there's so much more, you know, uh, point uh, to the rollout of Flare Network within this within uh, uh, smart contracts, mainly being an offset. To where Ethereum is. Uh, at the same time, if we see what XRP is doing uh, with the XLS20, uh, if they're able to create a an infrastructure to allow other assets to build um, on their infrastructure and roll out that way, you know that is a big game changer in the space. So we're starting to move into uh, a competitive environment where you know right now Ethereum you know kind of maintains the mantle. Uh, but if you're bringing in a solution like the XRPL that's natively uh, positive for you know financial assets, then you know when we look at you know some of the construction on top of it, like Flare Networks, which is really a big deal. Now I know um, who was it, John Doe? I think earlier was saying you know only been waiting around nine months uh, for some updates from Flare. Obviously, you know <laughs> we we want to make sure that everything that they're doing is correct because if they're going to be a game uh, changer in the space to take on where Ethereum is right now, because Ethereum needs uh, direct competition. And so if you're able to do that and then you're pairing it with XRP, with what XRP can do again, you know, with the XLS uh, 20 and, and a lot of uh, the direction, it, it's going to be amazing. So what one of what, you know, one of the key points here with the Flare Networks uh, is, you know, smart contract. Um, but it's not just the smart contract, it's the interoperable smart contract. That is big because right now within the Ethereum ecosystem, it is not interoperable. All it is is one solution. It's just you have to live and breathe uh, within the Ethereum ecosystem. So here, um, until recently, the XRP ledger did not support smart contracts, which limits the use of DeFi applications on blockchain and business in general. Um, things that can then happen. It's really, uh, uh, it's endless, the direction that things can move in. Uh, Flare Network is a blockchain that works across other blockchains, so that is interoperable. So I think these are really two solid points right here. Uh, we cannot, you know, highlight this one enough, the interoperability. Um, XRP supported on Flare until Flare, there was no way for a smart contract on a public blockchain to control an address on the XRP ledger, right? Uh, Flare allows an XRP holder to send their tokens to a smart contract that issues FXRP, similar to a wrap token, but doesn't require sent a central entity to issue it. That's a big deal. Um, unlike other smart contract blockchains, Flare does not link safety with the value of its token. <coughs> safety refers to how the blockchain transactions are validated. A secure network is very important. That's you know kind of goes without saying. Um, they had the Canary Network, as you guys remember, kind of rolled it out. They tested uh, the the main net, uh, which was really important. Uh, you know, so there was a lot of they got a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance um, over rolling out Canary, over rolling out Songbird. Um, obviously, a lot of people are using Songbird with Trustline um, and wrapping it, and you know, staking it with the oracles and et cetera. You know, and and watching your your SGB grow. Um, which was interesting uh, to do and watch. And uh, but so governance on Songbird and Flare may be tied similar to how the House and Senate must both pass a proposal. So it'll be interesting to see as we move forward uh, to see how this will all transpire. So now, the, obviously, the native token. Now, one of the you know big points that came up with all of this is that people got issued uh, SGB, but people are waiting for their Flare because you got the snapshot. You had your XRP in a in a in a wallet that was supported, and so some of the concern with all of this is that people had uh, XRP over on Coinbase, or if you had XRP over on Celsius, you know. So Celsius was one that was going that was accepting the flare drop, 
uh, and was going to release the the Flare tokens to uh, anybody that was operating or, or investing or holding assets over on the Celsius platform uh, and Coinbase. Coinbase was not distributing uh, Flare to their users. And there were some other instances like uh, in New York, I believe, you know, there, so there, there are a lot of issues uh, with that. And I think people got really upset uh, because they, you know, either there was a delay in getting a free uh, asset or, you know, people were upset because they were going to SGB uh, and, and they had the Canary Network. Yeah, I'm just watching this project. I think, you know, the project's great. If you benefit and you get some extra, you know, free flare and it actually has some value, you know, that's uh, that's an extra benefit. Uh, it's a bonus to it. But if we're watching this solution build out and it's building on the XRPL and it's giving more, I don't want to say legitimacy, but it's giving more mainstream uh, use case, more mainstream legitimacy uh, to the projects, then that is super meaningful. You know, again, it's all about, you know, going after, not going after, but taking on the one predominant force that's out there right now, which is Ethereum, you know, so having a counterbalance uh, to Ethereum is, is really, it's a big deal. Uh, so let's look a little bit deeper into Flare. Then we're going to move on. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it, but for those that don't know a lot about it, you know, you can go over to flare.xyz, easy to find. And here you go. I, I really, I like the logo, I like the color scheme. Uh, Flare is a new block. Blo uh, Flare is a new. Try to say that again. Blockchain, which enables secure uni universal interoperability between chains, scaling the use of blockchain by enabling all digital assets and on-chain information to flow freely. I like this. Um, and then I like this part right here. This is cross-chain interoperability with the security of multi-chain. I like cross-chain interoperability. I think again, that's that's the game changer. If it was just smart contracts, you would say, well, we've got Ethereum. What do we need Flare for? But it's, you know, we've got we've got Flare plus cross-chain interoperability. It's kind of like, you know, Ripple with RippleNet. It's like, okay, you've got another solution similar to Swift where you can, you know, communicate the movement of funds. Uh, maybe you do it a little bit better, but but so it's not, maybe it's not that exciting uh, to get banks to switch over to RippleNet, mainly because it's just a messaging platform. Uh, maybe get, again, it gives a little transparency, but are you gonna, going to change your entire infrastructure and your potentially hardware infrastructure uh, until they actually rolled it out so you can run off of a cloud server? But uh, imagine all those things that the banking, uh, uh, that the banking institutions are thinking about. Now, once you kind of, uh, move in this in this direction, like with RippleNet, that they said, oh, well, okay, we have the communication, we have transparency, but guess what? We also have on-demand liquidity. You can actually close your Nostro Vostro account. You're not going to have to keep, you know, uh, undisclosed amounts of money uh, sitting in accounts in other banks all over the world to facilitate the movement of money uh, because now we have d uh, liquidity that you can access. And you and we can move it, move your your assets uh, freely. Uh, you know, very uh, you know marginal cost, and it'll be almost instant. Can do it in four seconds. Uh, you know, when Swift, you have a third party mechanism, and it can take three to five days uh, to move money uh, in a, in a, in a global environment. Plus, you know, with that three to five days, you also have uh, you have uh, currency exchange uh, fluctuations. Uh, which can disrupt business, can you know disrupt uh, product costs, profitability, all these different things. So you want to move money seamlessly and efficiently. You want to you want money to move as fast as you can send a text. If I can send a text anywhere in the world through WhatsApp and I can have a full conversation, I should be able to move money the same way, and it shouldn't be bogged down by all this uh, by all this uh, you know uh, infrastructure that's. You know, for what? You know, what, what do you really need it for? You know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, weighs everything down. Uh, it's a complete offset uh, to, you know, true uh, interoperability. <laughs> so think about even in in financial institutions. If I want interoperability, I want to be able to move my U.S. currency over to Europe, and I want to, you know, buy something in Europe, but I don't want to have to worry about fluctuating exchange rates or 
I don't want to think about the cost of moving the money or, you know, uh, establishing trust lines, using third party banks to establish escrow accounts, uh, all these different letters of credit. I don't want to do things that are going to bog down my transaction and then have a huge cost on the front end and back end. You know, I want stuff that's going to flow uh, efficiently. And so when we think about this from that perspective, and then we look at what you can do with, um, you know, within the smart contract environment with interoperability and Ethereum doesn't have that, but Flare, the game changer is the cross chain interoperability. And the fact that it's built on the XRPL, which is native, you know, uh, with, you know, foreign currency exchange, it's it just, it's a native environment for everything that you want to do in a financial environment. So, so it's, it's actually really, you know, really positive. So we got a lot of great things going on with Flare, but what I wanted to get down to was, you know, some of the, uh, so here you have, uh, so many decentralized systems still rely on centralized data feeds. This bakes in centralization to the system using them. The FTS, the FTSO leverages the, uh, which is the Flare time series Oracle leverages the distributed nature of the network to provide rapidly updating accurate decentralized price data, such as live XRP to USD pricing. And then if you look, they are utilizing, you have the LTC USD, they have the Flare USD, and then Doge USD. So they put in and built in a use case for Doge, which is impressive. XLM, ADA, um, Algo, BCH, and then we're back to Flare. So it really, really impressive overall. Uh, Flare rollout. The FTC has been uh, live on Songbird since September 21. The State Connector since March of 22. So we got a lot more, a lot more going on over there. A lot more excitement. We'll have to get into it. We'll dig in and you know see some of the things that are uh, that are happening. So, uh, Mark, uh, Jeff will benefit <laughs> from the Flare. F <laughs> that'd be great. That's that's what we need. Need to get uh long, you know, super long hair. That'll be perfect. We'll have to rename it. <laughs> All right. So let's go back. Let me go over to El Jefe and then we're gonna move into the lawsuit. But El Jefe, so what's the opinion on the Fed versus the C B D C? So you know, I think that you know we have as I was referencing before, you know, we definitely have some issue, you know, first and foremost is the CBDC, which is the central bank, uh, digital, uh, you know, currency and just, just highlight central bank, uh, before you do anything, the biggest concern, and it's been referenced in the political circles, uh, uh, you know, that if you go digital, you have a major, uh, issue with, uh, potential issue with privacy. So what is the one key here in the economy in the U S is privacy private. You know, there's no government, you know, oversight on how you save your money or how you spend your money. If I want to use my money, I want to go buy, um, a thousand, uh, iPhones. I can go buy a thousand iPhones. No one is going to monitor my purchasing ability to buy those thousand iPhones. And when I do, um, if I decide I'm going to pay cash, and let's say, you know, there's the transaction, as long as it's not contraband or an illegal product, um, then there's no reason for the government to regulate my purchase or have oversight over my purchase by regulating my currency. So that's like the biggest concern with the CBDC, especially when we look at uh, the representation of what's happening over in, uh, you know, where with the digital yuan over in China with the digital yuan, you definitely have an issue because they already have an issue with social scoring. So if you have an issue with social scoring and then you you know, tie that into your currency, think about what they've done They're They're sh shutting down still, shutting down uh, cities uh, in order to uh, control uh, you know, some of the, these issues uh, that, that we've had over the past couple of years. They recently tried to shut down an entire Ikea. They sent officials in to close and lock the doors of an Ikea while people were still shopping. Right. And so imagine if they can do things like that, what are they going to do if they have unfettered access to your currency? Um, and so now the fed versus the CBDC. So or across the board, we have an issue. So unless we can address the privacy con uh, concern, which right now, if you have your credit card, still there's a, a there's 
you you know any anybody in the U.S. You're a citizen in the U.S. Then you're you know our our everyday life um, is protected by the Constitution, right? So you can't have a, a government entity that is eavesdropping, let's say, on my expenditures with a credit card, right? So at the end of the day, if you're not, let's say, paying your taxes or you know tax avoidance or things like that. You run into issue, but you're every day. If I decide I want to buy, you know, TVs every single day and then give them away, it's nobody's business what I do. Um, even the credit card companies, as long as you're paying them back, uh, there's there's no issue. Uh, and so that to me, that that's what this whole notion of the Fed with a central bank digital currency is uh, is is problematic. Oh yeah, I was out. Mosquitoes. It's horrible. We got the little ones. Uh, so he's like, what bit you? So you get the no see You can stand there and they're in the grass and they're like ankle height. So they're constantly like biting your ankle. And then you go out and then you get the mosquitoes depending on where you are. So you get the little no see near the grass. And then you get the, the bigger mosquitoes depending on where you go. And we have water behind the house. So um, we don't get a lot of mosquitoes, but sometimes all of a sudden they show up. Uh, so anyhow. Uh, all right. Let's see. When flare. <laughs> That's what said everybody wants to know. When flare, when clarity, when Gensler in handcuffs, when Indiana Jones five. Well, that one, we can skip Indiana Jones five. <laughs> we get, you can really end with the, the first one. Uh, <laughs> we want to know when with everything. That's true. You know, we want everything to uh, to move forward and we want some uh, some progress. That's what we really want. All right. Let's move on here. Um, here's another one. This is good. This is all going to be good stuff here. Let me put this up. Okay, now hopefully we can we can hear this one. Where's the? Okay, let's add this to the stream. Let's uh, pause this for a second. Now this is interesting. So we'll watch through this. This was on CNBC. Uh, thank you, uh, Russ. Uh, posted this on Twitter. Uh, it's short. Uh, this one should be loud enough. Let's uh, go large. Let's make sure it's loud enough. Have countries like, yeah, this one, this one is definitely loud enough. This is great. Um, so what we're starting to see is mainstream financial institutions understanding the significance uh, and power of this new financial technology of cryptocurrency. So it's you know it's obviously been real hush hush. It's it's been quiet. Um, now it's definitely coming out in the open on a regular interval. So. Um, uh, XRP panic. That's what I want to know when 30,000 subs, you know, it's interesting. We grow it in, uh, in chunks, all of a sudden it'll grow. And then all of a sudden it, it slows down a little bit. YouTube likes to, uh, tweak us a little bit. So anyhow, uh, let's check this out. Have countries like Switzerland and China all testing out the digital currencies. How are you gearing up for the disruption of money with central bank digital currencies? How will it change the way you and other banks operate in future? Uh, probably fundamentally, uh, while we're not formally involved, uh, no foreign banks are involved in the, in the Chinese uh, ECNY, uh, we, I think we're as close to that as we can be uh, to understand how that digital currency can be used for cross-border trade. Uh, you know, going back five years, we had digital currency underpinned uh, trade finance and money settlement systems. And you know, using, as a medium of exchange, using things like you know, I mean, Ripple's XRP, for example, you hear that? Let's back up. Talking about a medium of exchange. As a medium of exchange, using things like you know, I mean, Ripple's XRP, for example, as a uh, as, as a medium to affect real time cross border. <laughs> to affect real time, the rest of this is just this, but to affect real time cross border payments. You know why? Because you know it's it's all about it's all about the payments. And that's where, when we focus on it, when you're talking about money, it all emphasizes payments. Money needs a payment infrastructure. So if we're talking about uh, an adjustment to um, the flow of money, then we're talking about you know, payments. You can't just have uh, assets that are gaining in value without the payment infrastructure, but we do have that, right? Because you have different assets that have different purpose. You know, with Ethereum, the purpose has always been on the smart contract and, you know, they rolled out with the ERC-20s. And so you can build on the platform. Hopefully, as we were talking about earlier, 
um, with the XRPL and the XLS uh, 20, we'll start seeing some migration. You put in the flare networks. Obviously, with Bitcoin, the initial intent, uh, as everybody seems to understand, with Bitcoin, it was it, you know it was there to replace the banking infrastructure. Uh, as a payment solution, but as we've kind of grown into this, um, and we're more than a you know uh, more than ten years in, then we realize that Bitcoin isn't the solution uh, to really make massive change within the payment uh, within the payment infrastructure. And it is all about the payments. It is all about moving money, um, and it is all about uh, simplifying and making these transactions more efficient. Uh, but doing it transparently. Right now, if you work within the banking structure, uh, there is no transparency. So if you have no transparency in your process, how efficient is that? It's not. Plus, it's high cost. So if you can change that with Bitcoin, at least there was a little bit of transparency somewhat. But if it took 24 to 48 hours and you have no idea where your money is at that point because the Bitcoin is stuck somewhere, out there. It hasn't settled. Nobody knows where it is. It hasn't been received yet. And that's a scary moment for anyone who's gone through that. And you've had to sit for 24 to 48 hours plus uh, waiting and saying, hey, I wonder where that Bitcoin is. Oh, maybe it wasn't the most efficient, uh, efficient means, you know, but there are, you know, a lot of a lot of great solutions out there. So, all right, let's move into this. Let's move into uh, some lawsuit stuff. Let me get rid of this. I'm going to move into some lawsuit SEC stuff because that's where we want to be. Let's see. All right. I should be doing this. I should say, okay, it's time to talk about the lawsuit. Now we're going to talk about the SEC v. Ripple. All right. So SEC, I should probably share it first. Then I should do that. I should go to the brand and say, oh, it's time for SEC v. Ripple. All right. So. SEC tells the judge that XRP is not like Bitcoin. So this was back, what was this? This is March of 2021. So think about, you know, think about where we are today and where we've come from, you know, since they uh, decided to launch uh, this lawsuit. And we're going to dig into uh, some uh, current updated uh, things that are happening here. But SEC tells judge that XRP is not like Bitcoin or Ether. They question the utility of XRP. Again, remember, this is from uh, March of 2021. So this is a, a little ways back, a little over, you know. So in a new development in the SC, uh, Ripple SEC lawsuit during a hearing on March 19th, the commission's trial attorney, George uh, Tenero, told Magistrate Judge uh, Netburn that XRP cannot be compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Earlier this week, lawyers representing Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse and uh, co-founder uh, Chris Larson asked Judge Torres to compel SEC to produce documents about Bitcoin and Ethereum. So look at this tit for tat that keeps going back and forth. So they, remember that the SEC brought this lawsuit. The SEC comes in, makes a claim that XRP is a security. Okay. And then they say, well, it's not like Bitcoin, Ethereum. And Garlinghouse and Larson said, okay, that's great. Well, why don't you produce documents about Bitcoin and Ethereum? Let us, you know, prove to us what your st what your statement is, what your claim is, because you're saying that XRP is a security, but that both Bitcoin and Ethereum have been deemed as non securities. So if that's the case, cough it up. You know where where is it? What's going on here? So the SEC said the documents pertaining to the two of the world's largest crypto assets were not relevant in this case. So think about this is March of 21. The SEC brings the case. They think that if they say it, they say it's so, then it's so. Well, what they're finding is they say it's so and Ripple saying it isn't so. And the judge is like, you can't just say it's so without proving it's so. That's why you brought a lawsuit. So you have to prove your case that that XRP is a security. So, so what happened? You know, moreover, according to Commission Ripple, is not like Bitcoin because the company is one entity that has created these assets. It's fundamentally different. But what about Ethereum? I mean, we get it. During Ripple's legal counsel Matthew Solomon's presentation, Judge Nepburn asked if having a utility distinguished XRP from the other two assets. 
So it might not be relevant to the issue, but it's important to understand. My understanding of XRP is that not only does it have a currency value, but it also has a utility. And that utility distinguishes it, I think, from Bitcoin and Ether. Is that correct? So imagine that this is the direction that the case was taking back in 2021. So we go from uh, 2021 and we move forward to where we're at now. Well, let's go through a little bit more here uh, first. SEC's legal rep asserted the SEC needed to know all of the sales that occurred by executives and it was not required to take Ripple's word for it. <laughs> so here they don't have to take Ripple's word for it, but the court needs to take the SEC's word that XRP is not like Bitcoin and Ethereum and they won't produce the documents because it's not relevant to prove that Bitcoin and Ethereum are non-securities, but yet they're saying that Bitcoin and Ethereum, that XRP isn't like either one of them. <laughs> so it's it's so crazy, right? So this has been this uh, you know circular uh, argument that has been going on for almost what, two years? <laughs> I mean, it's it's ludicrous. You know, we're, we're getting there. We're getting to two years almost. So, so that's, that's kind of setting the tone when we think about the direction of the lawsuit. Um, and then we say, okay, but that's what's been happening. Where are we today? What's happening now, live, up to date, this moment? So James uh, Filan, which is great, puts an amazing amount of uh, information out there. And yesterday, uh, night, last night, he posted this. SEC reply brief and further support of objection. So here you have in this case, right, the SEC v. Ripple. The SEC has filed its reply brief in further support of its objection to Judge Nefrin's order compelling the SEC to produce the Hinman speech. So think about March 21, the judge is saying, and, and Ripple was trying to compel them to produce the documents on Ethereum and Bitcoin, and they're fighting, saying it wasn't relevant. Then they now the uh, the judge is saying we you have to produce the Hinman speech materials, and they've been fighting that and saying it isn't relevant, right? They don't want to produce it. So then you know Fred uh, Rispoli here, you know he comments. I want to open this one up because he said haven't seen anyone clip this part yet. <laughs> if you did, nice job. But I stopped reading at page two after I read. The below that's an eye roll from Judge Torres for sure when she read this, right? So here you have, uh, there we go, misleading characterizations and ignore statements unhelpful to their position. A careful review of the record shows that the SEC has never departed from its contention that the speech did not reflect the agency's position but did reflect Director Hinman's personal views as the director of Corpfin and consequently the views of the division he had he led. So they, the SEC kept saying that it was the agent, you know, wasn't the agency's position, it was personal opinion. And then, you know, and that it's like this this argument that they're trying to bring us on that they think that if they keep arguing in this uh, in this maze, that you know, eventually we're gonna say Wow, we're just so confused. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. You know, El Hefe saying you just can't make this shit up. And it's true. <laughs> you know, if you were to say, you know, that if you were to say, you know, a couple of years ago uh, that the SEC is going to file a lawsuit and then they're going to spin the lawsuit for two years plus and, you know, keep just arguing these cyclical arguments without any fi finalization to it and make ridiculous statements and insult the judge. And you'll have attorneys that seem completely ill-prepared uh, to fight their case. I mean, it's just like, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You know, you just, you just wouldn't believe it, you know? Um, so we saw, okay, so let's go to Deaton. I, I like this one. I like Deaton. So Deaton comes out. And this was, when did he post this one? This was recent. Am I sharing the screen? Yep. Okay. So Dean comes out and he says, this is classic disassociation and it's legal gibberish, which is, is right. I mean, it's just, it's so asinine that I'm surprised that the judge is, is allowing any of this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, right? So then they get in, but you know, the speech draft, whatever, reflects only the personal views of citizen Hinman. So now they want to mince words. So now we're talking about the personal views of Hinman when he was, you know, 
when he was actually involved. Now, all of a sudden, he isn't. Before he was speaking for the agency, now he's not, you know, and, you know, he or the agency was using his views, but now he's citizen Hinman. So he's not just any Hinman. He's all of a sudden become citizen Hinman, as though we're, we're sitting in some, uh, you know, just using that kind of terminology, <laughs> citizen Hinman just reeks of not being in this country. You know, it's insane. I, I just, I just can't believe that, you know, the SEC would, you know, and now they're just using, you know, just complete gibberish. Like John Deaton says, uh, John uh, J J V is saying, so any citizen can get hired at the uh, citizen. <laughs> I like that can get hired at the SEC, make statements, give speeches, but once they're gone, the markets and participants supposed to just forget about it. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's just, it is so ass backwards that it's, it's, it's insane. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy, you know, just go away. That's it. You know, it's just over and over and over. So just a citizen, that's what we're going to reference. Just the, just the citizen, nothing to see here. Don't worry about this. It's, a, oh my God. So here's uh here we go. So Deaton continues. Here we go. He goes, uh, I'm on record saying we got lucky to draw Judge Netburn, Judges Netburn and Torres. That doesn't mean I agree with every ruling. Under the law, Judge Netburn uh, could have uh, pierced the privilege on the XRP memo uh, because it's impossible for Ripple to obtain the evidence otherwise in DPP as, need, as, a, as a need exception. <clears throat> so he goes on, since the 2018 XRP memo didn't recommend enforcement or a cease and desist letter against Ripple, it's fair to assume it didn't conclude XRP was a security, likely inconclusive. That's huge evidence in Ripple's favor, yet she chose not to pierce the privilege in the SEC's favor. So ticket to the moon, would a cease and desist letter have a lesser form of punishment than the enforcement action? Uh, not sure I worded that correctly regarding potential dismissal. Um, so John Deaton uh, continued, what would be sweet justice is if Judge Torres did a complete de novo review, it means fresh and new, and overruled Judge, Judge Nepern's decision on the XRP memo, ordering it turned over along with the Hinman emails. But that won't ha happen. She will affirm what Judge Nepern decided. So just a, a ton of things that it's just, again, you know, when we, when we get into this, I feel like sometimes we're continuously talking about, you know, some of this stuff, you know, over and over and over again. But Bill said, thanks, James. Finally, just read this after being in court most of the day. I cannot understand whether the passage I highlighted uh, in the extract is a new position or a combination of previous positions. I've lost count. <laughs> the SEC states the speech is an agency communication, right? So then it goes on talking about Hinman speech. One, agency communication can only reflect either personal views or agency views. Uh, okay, the DPP and attorney client privilege protect only deliberation about specific agency decisions and not deliberations that reflect personal views of agency staff. But as the SEC has explained, one, agency communications, like the speech, may reflect personal views and agency staff views without reflecting agency position. In any event, the DPP protects the personal views of agency staff for deliberating over the agency's policies. So can, can you imagine, as, as, as they're talking about this stuff, I mean, it's just like, over and over and over and over again. So Bill said, which contains Hinman's personal views and staff views, but not the agency's position. Which part uh, makes the Hinman speech an agency communication and an internal SEC document? Hinman's personal views or agency staff view or both, given the SEC states, it does not reflect the agency's position. Okay. So an agency communication can contain the agency's position and also not contain it and just contain person. Holy, can you imagine? I mean, this is what it's come down to. It it almost as you go back, you know, if you go back to uh, to Clinton when he was debating, the word is depends what your definition of the word is is. What? How can you want to you want to you know mince it down to this minute definition of is because. That's how you're going to defend yourself. So now we get all this, like Deaton was saying, it's just legal gibberish. And 
a lot of double speak and these circular arguments and you get so confused that it's it's crazy you know what is up hydroponic ellen great to see you on awesome um we got oh, money bag uh not bob says sec is typical of the whole government <laughs> we're seeing a lot of that recently you know they they run around like you know they they can do no harm and that's all they're doing everything they touch government workers need to wear beanie caps with flashing <laughs> red lights when they're speaking uh and, on the record and green when uh when seeking speaking fee uh, oh, on the record <laughs> sorry on the record <laughs> on the record they should yeah they should always be recorded. Everything that they say, they should be recorded and they should be audited. Especially, especially you have uh, appointed, appointed uh, politicians that aren't elected, so they don't have to represent the people's interest. They're there to work and earn a paycheck and that's it. They are, they're appointed. They, yes, they're working in government, but that's because they're making big dollars. If they're getting paid $30,000 as a volunteer position, uh, it would be a completely you know, different world. You know, but since they're not, they're appointed with, you know, pretty decent sized salaries. If you look at some of the salaries out there, you know, it's crazy. So if we say, you know, what does SEC chair uh, earn per year? Uh, let's see if this comes up. Say it should be, uh, how much does the head of the SEC make? Um, says here, the head of the SEC. A uh, salary for the salary for com, for a uh, commissioner at the U.S. Uh, Securities Exchange Commission is only ninety one thousand. That's how much the commissioner. How much does the uh, uh, let's see SEC compensation? So that's what we want to see. I want to see. But either way, you know, they're there to get a paycheck. They're not there volunteering their time. But here's the base pay effective April of twenty two for these employees. So you have. Uh, some employees at the bottom where they're kind of like grade one, making 22 to 32. These people are working because they, you know, but then you get into the upper echelon. Now we get to um, a 17 supervisor. Uh, they're making 123 to about 213,000. Uh, level 16, about 116 to 198. Now you tell me you're making $200,000 a year working for the government. You don't care one iota about the people. You're there working for the SEC because it's a paycheck, just like anything else. You know, you might have passion for economics, but you don't care about the people. The faster and sooner they'll admit that, the better off we're going to be. Here it says um, senior officers, the pay ranges for senior officer levels. Let me see, is this, I want to make sure I'm in the right thing. This is all human resources, how the SEC sets salaries. Yeah, so we got, that was... Base pay ranges, we talked about that, it was from 22 all the way up to 213. Then there's uh, locality rates. Uh, the locality rate presented below are applied to an employer's basic pay. I guess I should put this over here. You know, I just find this stuff uh, interesting, right? So you have the locality pay. Um, then you have senior officers. So a senior officer, level one senior officer making a minimum of 190 with a cap of 275. Um, all the way up to level three, which is 281,000. So you tell me, okay, you got a senior level. This is a career, a career uh, employee here, you know, with the SEC. They don't care about the people. <laughs> there's, there's no, no caring about the people. They're there again to make a paycheck and you can't fault them for that. But at the same time, you see these people and you look and say, okay, why is the SEC? Well, you got, they got their lawyers and then you have the appointed officials. Why would we put any reliance in them doing the right thing to actually help us? Makes no sense. Makes no sense at all. So, you know, that's kind of where, where that uh, leaves us. Uh, I thought you really had a lemon tree. Man, lemon tree is awesome. The lemon tree is awesome. All right. So what else we got here? Let's move on. We have got, let's see, I left a uh, supervisory letter, Federal Reserve, hedge fund. Uh, let me see here. Where did this come from? I think we're 
kind of getting to the bottom. All of a sudden, there's some new articles in here that I didn't see. So this is interesting, too. Let me pull this over here. We are loading up lots and lots of articles. All right. So we've got um, Federal Reserve Board provides additional information for banking organizations engaging or seeking to engage in crypto asset related activities. Now, this is interesting too. Let me go try to go full screen on this. It's a little bit big and then we'll see what we can uh, what we can get here. But all right, let me uh, let me see. All right. So anyhow, so the Federal Reserve Board, there we go. All right, the Federal Reserve Board on Tuesday provided additional information for banking organizations engaging or seeking to engage. And so this is this is interesting. Again, you know, we uh, El Jefe brought that up once. Let's talk about the Federal Reserve, uh, CBDCs. Uh, but look at what's happening. You know, this is happening on such a rapid uh, pace right now that we're starting to see uh, we're starting to see more and more uh, movement, you know, by whether it's the banking institution or more discussion at the government level. Um, obviously, we see a lot of uh, pandemonium right now, a lot of chaos that's going on uh, within government as usual. Um, but we're going to see some major changes come November. But look at what's happening here. So the emerging, emerging crypto asset sector presents potential opportunities to banking organizations, their customers, and the overall financial system. However, Crypto assets related activities may also pose risk related to safety, soundness, consumer protection, and financial stability. So those are some of the things they want to highlight here. It goes on. Supervisory letter also emphasized the board that board supervised banking organization should have adequate systems and control in place to conduct crypto asset related activities. So they they're basically letting banks know now in advance, you want to get into crypto assets, you should get into crypto assets. Uh, the whole uh, direction is moving into crypto assets. And if you want to engage in crypto assets, here's some of the things that you have to really concern yourself with. And one of those things would obviously be you know, posing a risk to related safety and soundness, consumer protection, financial stability. Now, um, absent and this, this to me, I think is, oops, there we go. <laughs> I removed myself from the stream, but, you know, absent um, anything, you know, net positive here, um, it, it's amazing when we see the Fed, we see, uh, you know, uh, individual, you know, uh, individuals within, uh, within Congress. Uh, we even saw, you know, that they, you know, try to pass an executive order um, all in and around uh, this digital asset space, uh, this crypto space. And then you really have to question, you have to really wonder, you know, exactly why, you know, why now, you know, why are they, you know, moving in, in, in such a rapid, at such a rapid pace? What are they trying to gain out of it? What, what's the upper hand that they want to hold on to? Um, and, Man, you know, start seeing you know some memos like this that are are dropping. You know, it's really uh, to me, it's it's interesting. You know, again, you know, to see how fast. And then we still have the SEC v. Ripple case hanging out there, while all these other things. It's almost as though, you know, the SEC and and many of the others realize the pace at which uh, the crypto space was getting away from everyone. It was happening too fast. They all, they knew it was going to happen fast, but they didn't think it was going to happen at the pace that it was unfolding. Um, and if it's going to happen that quickly, they say, you know what, maybe we need to put the brakes on it. The best way to put the brakes, let's get uh, Gary Gensler with his pil pillars of enforcement and we'll start launching lawsuits. I, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe that's, that's the case, but here we have a uh, hedge fund billionaire, Steve Cohen laying the groundwork for an investment firm focused on crypto. So a lot of things um, happening, a lot of movement uh, in this space, which is just really it's uh, it's outstanding. You know, again, you know, when we're starting to really see, you know, some rapid, rapid uh, transition of the financial space. And we're all so early. We all said how early, you know, we made it to this space, you know, super, super early. Um, so we know we got here early. We know that, 
you know, as a, you know, an early adopter or, you know, early investor, there's still a lot of runway in, in the build out space. And you obviously saw that, you know, with any, any major project, any change, uh, that, that we're going to see, uh, you're going to have, you know, that kind of experience. And so now what we have to do is really stay, you know, on point and really watch, you know, everything that unfolds because right now, you know, again, you know, the powers that be are going to do everything they can to hold on to the old way of doing things while this whole new transition is taking place. But if a new transition takes place, we have to be very cognizant that it doesn't move in the direction of full, you know, centralized control, which erodes our privacy of our money. And that to me is, you know, that that's, that's the basis right there. If we allow them to erode the privacy of our money, then, you know, then it's problematic. So anyhow, you guys are amazing. Uh, this was an outstanding chat, even though I'm glimmering and glowing, uh, my shirt, you know, every time I wear uh, this color shirt, I glimmer and glow. So anyhow, uh, but we'll be back Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, you guys are the best and the brightest, the smartest in all of YouTube crypto space. If you want to check out a good chat, head on over to uh, Berserker. Uh, Berserker's got his. I think Hans Loaded is throwing his up. Those guys are going to have a lot of chats over there. You have all the, the Blue Wrench crew gather in uh, the Berserker chat. And with that, we will check you guys out on the next one. I'm out. Are you down, Are you with, down OTC? with OTC? Please like, please like, subscribe, subscribe, and click, and the, bell click the bell to be notified when the next, when the next video drops. drops.